Mr. Moynihan. He's either at the UN or at Harvard. Yes, sir. Hello. I've reached Dr. Moynihan for you, sir. There you are. Hello. Good morning, Mr. President. Where are you? I'm I'm uh, in New York writing a speech which I'm going to give today at the United Nations and give the Russians a little hell, son of a bitch. Right, good. <laughs> uh, have you got a minute or is it bad time? I do, sir. In fact, I'm writing a speech and I'm delivering tonight at 7.30, I so I'm good. We're, going to we're right in the middle of it. But it's brief, so you can listen. 14 minutes. Can you, Ed, does your retention time that long? Uh, uh, I never... Don't admit it. Yeah. <laughs> I was... The uh, uh, reason I called you, as a matter of fact, I... You know, I sort of read things from him, but on, on my way, when I was in Florida going over to Walker's, I read with with great interest your your piece from the UN. You know, you you on on Hernstein's piece, you know, yes. that I'd passed on to you. Yes, of course. Let me say first of all, uh, no, nobody in the staff even knows I read the goddamn article. Oh, good. And nobody in this staff is going to know anything about it because, as I couldn't agree more with you, that the Hernstein stuff and all the rest. This is knowledge. First, nobody must think we're thinking about it. And second, if we do find out it's correct, we must never tell anybody. I'm afraid that's just the case. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Now, <clears throat> let me add a few things if you can, and you might just make some mental notes about it or anything you want, just to, so I give you my own views. I've reluctantly concluded, based at least on the evidence presently before me, and I don't base it on any scientific evidence, that, that what Hernstein says, and also what... Uh, uh, was said earlier by uh, Jensen mm -hmm. and so forth is based, is probably very close to the truth. Now I think that's now, where you'd have to be yeah. as an outsider. Now, now, having come, having said that, that that then you copper that by saying something that the racists would never agree with. That within groups there are geniuses. There are geniuses within black groups. There are more within. Asian groups, and incidentally, it was a rather neat trick to point out that the Asians are number one, and the, <laughs> the Caucasians are number two, and the Eskimos, and the Eskimos are above the whites, <laughs> which is good. Oh. The other, the, and also your little deal about the English and the Irish. Uh -huh. Now that is the best example of the fact. This is knowledge, but it is knowledge that it is better not to know. At least, good God, but it would, it would cause another war. They're having enough damn problems in Northern Ireland now. Exactly. And and basically, there are Irish geniuses. Well, I think... Right. What are, uh, you've Burke? got a few Irish presidents, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, Burke wasn't bad. <laughs> well, I mean, this is not bad. Uh, some of the liberals said. <laughs> now, so let me say that in getting this knowledge, uh, and, and, and that's the point that I... And it's, you're, you're welcome to pass this on to Hernstein as we talk about it. And getting started, telling that I think the reason I have to know it is that as I go for programs, I must know that if they, that they have basic weakness. And did you read Glazer's piece in commentary recently? Yes, sir, the limits of social policy. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Sir. And, uh, uh, you know, he didn't come out against family assistance, but he just raised a hell of a lot of questions. But he said, well, it's already got it in New York and isn't working and so forth and so on. But right. you respect Glazer, don't you? Oh, he's my very dear friend. And Yeah. Sure. Well, tell him I read his piece, too. And oh, I, well, certainly. Well, and, uh, he feels that what he meant was that, that the family assistance should not be we should not expect it to change the world. Yeah. Well, what he meant, though, but what he meant, what was interesting to me was that he said that even in Sweden, the ultimate example, and in Britain, the less ultimate example, that they still have a tremendous emphasis on the work ethic. Mm -hmm. In other words, that, that going on going on welfare just sort of ain't the thing people ought to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, th that is, of course, the reason why the work requirement thing is so important here. I mean, Damn right. everybody says, well, God, you can't work. The work requirement's only for the purpose of making these poor poor colored women, you know, who can't work and with little babies coming every month, or, or it's every nine months, I believe. Anyway, whatever the case is, you can't make them work. Well, now, that isn't it. The whole point is that uh, as you well know, that uh, we, we just have not got to sort of get into the psychology that, uh, well, that uh, welfare is a good way of life. That is, that that's where the working poor comes which, in, et cetera, et cetera. Which, and, and the point about family assistance is it gives an, op an alternative to welfare as a way of Exactly. Life. Well, now, coming on to the other points, uh, the, uh, on the other hand, side, and here's where... I think we have to bear in mind, we've got to realize on family assistance, on anything we do, uh, the limits of social policy. Right. If we don't, we're going to raise expectations.
limitations and then have the dull thud. That was the problem with Johnson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Johnson's, uh, he took your Howard University speech and he carried out a lot of things, but he, but, but I really don't, and it's an, I don't think he did it deliberately. I think Johnson probably convinced himself all this stuff is going to work. Oh, you agree? Uh, can, can I just say one thing, sir? Yeah. One of the uh, fascinating things is in 1967, he announced an, uh, a great program of new towns in town to start building oh, yeah. cities yeah. in town, and you had to deal with the ends of it. In 1968, the beginning, he sent a message to Congress in which he said, even now, a new town is rising on the site of Fort Lincoln in, in, in the city of Washington, D.C. At that moment, not a single spade of earth had been turned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. he didn't know it. He thought it was going yeah. on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Still now, hasn't been, incidentally. Right. Now, coming to the other point, I, a couple of questions. Is Coleman, has Coleman demonstrated the fact that where you put uh, uh, blacks, or for that, exam, uh, that matter, underprivileged Chicanos or anybody else, blacks in with whites integrated, that it raises the blacks and does not bring down the whites? Uh, Is that clear? A, yes, up, up to a point of... Uh, now, now, the second point I raise then, and I raise this, and this is this is really hitting at the nerve center. Mm -hmm. Is this true when you have an integrated faculty? Oh. Now, now, now let's now let's suppose let's take let's take for example where my daughter was teaching she broke a foot yeah. or was going to teach. Let's suppose Pat that you got a black mm -hmm. graduated from a good black college mm -hmm. in the South teaching English. Now, do you believe that she can teach English? Um. We've got some... I don't know. I'm, I'm not... I'm not. Could I, I just don't know. to send you a short note on this? Because yeah. we can give you fairly exact answers. Yeah. Uh, Mosteller and I have a big, enormous book coming out in a few months, uh, redoing the whole Coleman uh, data. Coleman had to do his analysis in about yeah. five months. Yeah. And we've redone it all, and we know, mm -hmm. and he's done it with us, and we know more now. I can give you good answers to that, sir. Let me first of all say that the main thing the main thing that matters is 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 the other students that child is with i see and it will ra the teachers matter very little the classrooms matter not at all uh and oh i see the kids teach the kids the kids they set standards for each other mm -hmm. and if well, maybe what you've got to do though with this if you're going to have incompetent teachers is to go for more television aids and all that sort of stuff well maybe no? uh i would give the mother's money frankly uh, mm -hmm. We have absolutely no evidence that any increase in school expenditure makes much difference. Mm -hmm. And I should have to say to you very well, clearly, because we say this in this new book, well, give me that, then. that the, uh, you raise the level of lower class kids a little bit, not a lot, mm -hmm. but a little bit, mm -hmm. when you put them in with other kids. But if you put middle class kids in with a majority of lower class kids, you lower the middle class achievement without raising the upper, the the the, the, the lower class. I see. You the, the, what really raises them is the bright kids. Right, and it, and and the and the the, the not so bright kids have to be in a, in a minority. Yeah. If they're a majority, they swamp everything. That seems to be. Oh yeah, that's right. That's why they. That's why that in the north, where as you know now, those st astounding statistics, where as, as a result of what we yes, the sir. agony Mrs. that thirty eight integrated in California. Thirty eight percent of all black children in the south go to majority white schools. 28% of all black children in the North go to majority white. Now, that is a hell of an indictment. And you did it. That's right. Now, coming on to a few things that... Uh, also, on, on with regard to your theories, I've noticed that none of you have used this. And I'm not getting into what Agnew said about black leaders, because in this sense he's wrong. Uh, have in mind one fact. Did you realize there is not... Of, of the 40 or 45, you're at the United Nations. Yeah. Black countries that are represented there. Not one has a president or a prime minister who is there as a result of a contested election, such as we were insisting upon in Vietnam. My God. That's there aren't any. Right. Yeah. There aren't any. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Liberia, now that's ours. We've got 150 <laughs> years. How the hell is that? No, Talbert is the son-in-law of the other fellow. <laughs> he's an awful nice fellow. But he's at, at, and then let's look at Mobutu in the Congo. <laughs> Kenyatta. Uh, all of their leaders, Pat. Sure. Now, what, let's take Haiti. Haiti's right our neighbor here. Now, what I'm, 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 not, I'm simply saying now that is, is this. I'm not saying that blacks cannot govern. I am saying they have a hell of a time. <clears throat> now, that must demonstrate something. Now, having said that, let's look at Latin America. 
Latin America's had 150 years of trying at it, and they don't have much going down there either. Not Mexico is a one-party government. Colombia, they trade it every trade it off every two years. Uh, Venezuela is tippy toe, and uh, uh, the rest are dictatorships, except for uh, Allende, which is a communist dictatorship, yeah. elected but communist. Now, now let me let me come back to another point. Within that scheme, th this thought, and I think you might want to do a little piece on this sometime, is my, I think you may have heard me tell of my conversation with Munoz Marine, who incidentally was capable of governing. Yes. Uh, you know, I think you think well of him. And I, in 58, after Lima and Caracas, I stopped there. And he, he and I talked all night, you know, he drinking his scotch and, you know, and he really lived it up. And uh, I tried to keep up with him, practically dead. But he made a very interesting point very late, early in the early morning hours. He said, look, he says, I, I shouldn't say this. He said, but Mr. Vice President, my people have many fine qualities. I mean, they're, they're courteous. They're, they're good family people in, in the arts and, uh, you know, philosophy, etc. But he said, I will have to admit, my people, speaking of Latins generally, have never been very good at government. Yeah. Now, let's look at that. The Italians aren't any good at government. The Spanish aren't any good at government. Yeah. Uh, the French have had a hell of a time, and they're half Latin. And all of Latin America is not any good at government. They either go to one extreme or the other. It's either to, it's either a family, uh, well, uh, three extremes: family oligarchy, uh, or a uh, uh, dictatorship, or a dictatorship on the right, or one on the left. Mm -hmm. Very seldom in the center. Now, having said all that, however, as you compare. The Latin dictatorships, governments, etc., and their forms of government, they are, they at least do it their way. It is an orderly way which works relatively well. They have been able to run the damn place. Looking at the black countries, uh, of course, there are only two old ones. Haiti is an old one, and Liberia is a very old one. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia is a very old one. Uh, but they have a hell of a time running the place. It's a pretty miserable world. Now, now, now you, you look at Asia, and you can say, well, what about out there? You don't have democracies. Of course you don't, except Japan, where we imposed it, and the Philippines, and it's a hell of a mess. But on the other hand, Thailand, with its oligarchy, has the right kind of a government for Thailand. And we have to say, too, that Iran, with a benevolent Shah, well. with a benevolent Shah, that's the right thing for those folks, I think. Now, what I'm getting back a, a long way around is this. I think something, uh, I think something could be uh, that, that's, that's eventually going to come out here is this: that that and this right beneath the surface, this old black-white deal is going to come out the fact that 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 uh, Asians are capable of governing themselves one way or another. Uh, we and the Caucasians have learned it after slaughtering each other in religious wars and other wars for many, many years, including a couple in the last this century. Sure. Uh, the Latins do it in a miserable way, but they do it. But the Africans just can't run things. Now, this is a very, very fundamental point in the international scene. See my point? Oh, boy, and, you sure see it around this place. Well, how? In, yeah, of course you do. You, you see them. You know, I, I have mixed feelings. I receive their ambassadors. They change all the time, and I've had in Paris. I love them. They're so kind and so nice. And they're children. Yeah. yeah. Children. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> you know? And they always want something like children. Oh, God, yes, they want. Well, what can you do? I, I know, but what I meant is it's so childlike, the childlike faith and the chi uh, this and that. And, of course, a lot of them are crooks, but uh, we have crooks, too. But anyway... What I'm getting at is, I think you've got in the field of business, you've got the field of education, so so on. But there are many other areas, as you've well pointed out, where they can beat the hell out of us. Now, and they should be proud of those. Uh, mm -hmm. Athletics isn't a bad achievement. Not Man, a you look at the World Series, for God's sakes, and what would either of these teams done without, what would Pittsburgh be without <laughs> hell of a lot of blacks, huh? Sure. And, and, and music, the dance. Uh, now, and these things, are they, are they to be therefore just pissed upon? Hell no. They're important. And also, also, in certain areas, poetry, etc., they, they have a free and easy style that is, creates enor adds enormously to our culture. But on the other hand, when you get to some of the more, shall we say, some of the more uh, prof profound, rigid disciplines, basically, 
they have a hell of a time making it. That, that it so you mean, far, and Ed Brooke, for example, is an exception. You, you, we've got to face it. In terms of good lawyers, there are damn few good lawyers among any group, but among in terms of good lawyers, even though a lot of them go to law schools, I mean, it is not really their dish of tea. See? Mm -hmm. Now, there's that's a fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we, we got Brooke, and we've got that fellow, the head of the Equal Opportunities, the, the thin fellow from Philadelphia, you know. He's, no problem. He's, he's got it. Mm -hmm. He's got it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, but now, having said that, you have a hell of a time also. I mean, I sit with a lot of Mexicans. I oh, mean, geez. they're coming up. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, but, but on the other hand, they have, they have the stuff. Y your culture-free tests are very interesting to me. That, as I understand it, is basically an IQ test, but which, which basically it doesn't require you to know a damn thing before you take it. It presumes that you know no language. Well, that's good. You see, that you can't speak, I mean, it doesn't require that you, the only, you know, that you don't the only, speak English or Spanish yeah. or Eskimo. You the only fair kind of a test. Now, let me tell you what my theory is after all this. My theory is that the responsibility of a president in my protect present position first is to know these things. Right. Damn. But also, but also, my theory is that I must do everything that I possibly can to deny them. Yes, sir. Uh, to deny them because you could, you cannot tell. Here was, let me say, here was my quarrel with 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 Muskie on the vice president thing, and I didn't quarrel with him. I I refused to come in. I, they asked me what I'd said, and I said I just repeated what I said in '68 when I was commenting on Brooke. I said he could be in any position. My theory is this: if you look, if you are to look cynically at a poll in depth that is absolutely private as to whether or not a black would or would not add to a ticket, you might well find that a black would subtract. But no leader must ever say that. I so, right. Because if he says that, he is condemning a great segment of the population. He shouldn't say that no Jew. Now, I think you could make a hell of a case that a Jew, uh, not one like Goldwater, who's basically a, a Gentile, I mean, uh, by religion, but a Jew might detract. There are some anti-Semitic people, sure. but nobody must ever say that. You must not say that a Catholic would hurt you in Oklahoma. You must not say that. Here, the point that I make is, we have to realize it because if we do not, if we do not, we are going to, we're going to encourage what is a latent prejudice among all of us. That's, that, yes. See, you, 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 you must not, it's, in other words, it's the unthinkable. It's the, Do you agree with me? It's unthinkable. And when somebody says, well, it's honest to get up and say, why, well, sure, a black shouldn't be on the ticket. The hell, it's honest. And it can be what we call a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. You take, for example, a woman in the Supreme Court. Now, if you were to poll the people in this country, all the people, a great majority would be against a woman in the court. I mean, they don't have that much confidence in women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, among women, there's a hell of a feeling that there should be one. All right. My point is, no one should ever say that a woman should not be on the Supreme Court. Right. Correct? Correct. So, so, you see, so you see what I'm getting at is that, yeah, that we're on exactly the same wavelength. I'm putting it out all over this place that we have got to proceed on the assumption, not that everybody is equal, but that everybody should have an equal opportunity and that anybody might go to the top. And God knows he might. A brook could, you know. Exactly. See? Uh, could I uh, say two things quickly? Right. First, you, you know, in, in one of the things that a, a president can do so well is to reward the achievement where it does occur. Right. Here at the United Nations, we have two Americans, both very sick, about to retire. They're the only two Americans in the secretary. Ralph Bunch. Ralph Bunch and Paul Hoffman. Well, I've already had Hoffman down. Uh, is there any possibility? Would you ever give me? I, I noticed, and I was so. Bunch, the Medal of Freedom. The Medal of Freedom to Brosio. I bet. I think Bunch has it. Uh, See, he got a Nobel Prize. Well, you can. There, there are. Uh, there, there are. I'll check it out. You can give him a higher degree of the Medal of Freedom. Uh, I'll check it out. I'll check it out to see. I think, and I think Hoffman has it, but I, but I'll check with Bunch on it. Some kind of recognition. Yeah. Right. It'd be very easy. No, it's very easy. Uh, and if we don't give him Medal of Freedom, we could just get him down and thank him. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure you can do that. He's so too sick. Now. But you could probably do it. You know, you can do it. Of course. Is he in a hospital? Yes. And he sometimes is sort of completely. Yeah, I know. Lost consciousness or lost yeah. lost awareness. Well, we went out though and gave one to Sam Goldwyn. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> the other thing, yeah. two other things. First, I will get you a. St uh, if, w can you stand a short memorandum on those questions you asked me? Yeah, yeah, yes. Get to those. For my own information. And and the other, another thing, when this UN thing is over, it's 
if I could have maybe two or three, uh, well, 10, 15 minutes with you to talk about the Pakistan situation. I'm yeah. deeply concerned. Yeah. And I think within the year's time, mm. you might want to have to do something. It's a tough one. It's, it's a, a very tough, tough one. one. Yeah. Would, would you be sure you hear, be sure, though, that this is just for balance, and I have mixed feelings on it. Be sure you don't get it just from the Indians. They're terrific oh, salesmen. Oh, Jesus, God, no. Because they oh, are, uh, those, those we are, we are, they're blowing up the damn boats and everything. And, oh, uh, absolutely. And, uh, I, but, but I'd love to talk to you about it. Now, let me come before we come to that uh, thing. First, on the legislative program, the National Institute is in. Yes, isn't that good? Uh, I mean, what I meant is, I, I raised that question at the, when we met with the uh, education leaders the other day, and, and Elliot Richardson says, we got it. I don't know when it's going to come in, but it's in. Apparently, it got to the House Committee if you yeah. did that direction, yeah. yeah. But to the Office of Child Development, I'd like for you to give it a kick. I mean, uh, I'd like for you, if you would, to give Elliot a call. Yes. And also give Marlon, who's a fine fellow, right. a call. Tell him that I was talking to you and said, what the hell became of the first five years of life? Okay. And you just tell them and call, and then they don't worry, that'll stir them up. Then, all right, sir. Third, on the secondary school education, we spent half of our time in our meeting with educators on that. The most profound thing you say in there is that the one job we do worst in this country is turning boys into men. Mm -hmm. We've got to connect up the world of school with the world of work. We've, uh, that we've got to get through, that one line. We have got to connect up the world of school with the world of work, and high school is where to do it. Now, we, we just have one hell of a time here that, that everybody's going to college, and we're running out of our ears with PhDs and this and that and the other thing, and uh, nobody wants to work. And, uh, uh, and and the kids don't know how to work. They I don't know. know when, so you know, it's not like you watch your father from That's the right. time you're four, and then you know. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? On this whole business of menial work and so forth, I just, uh, Bob Allman is talking about his plumber, and he says, God, I, he's Joe Johnson, he works four days a week, he makes $30,000 a year, <laughs> I mean, he takes off a month in the winter and a month in the summer, and he has no responsibilities, whatever. <laughs> what the hell now, that, just to make the goddamn toilet flush, that's not bad. That's not bad. Huh? <laughs> Listen, I, can I mention that we had this conversation, too, with Elliot about the world of work? Thing? The wor that's right. The, 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 the secondary schools. The secondary schools. Section. The work thing, I know he agrees with, but the secondary school thing is important for the reason that the educators came down, Pat, and you can imagine, the NEA and all the rest, all they talked about was more money. Yeah, that's all. They didn't talk about reform. They were for the Institute, but more money, and they didn't talk enough about this whole, voc uh, the word vocation I know is a bad word, but, but, they have let but, but they do, words. but they do not, they don't want that. Because the bastards don't teach it anymore. Yeah. They don't even teach hygiene anymore. And, so then, and they go around yeah. wondering why 25% of the kids in yeah. Harlem are unemployed. Now, now, they have got to start teaching that. And, and, you know, Finch, was that was one of his major contributions. He gave that a hell of a kick yeah. in the ass. And we got a few junior colleges. But would you tell, tell, tell uh, Marlon and the rest that I am very disturbed about the fact that we are going hog wild on education, and you know we're going to put a lot more in it. Believe me, because yeah. it's a big lobby and the rest. But what in the hell are we doing? The institute will help over the long run. Uh, the right to read thing, for example, is uh, that's that's just rumbling along with nothing being done, and that's terribly important. But when we really come down to it, what are we doing in the high schools with these the great majority of our kids who basically do not have what it takes? And we'll never have it uh, to sit behind desks. No. And now, all you do is to destroy those kids, and so they go on dope. Well, and make them. Why should they be miserable when they can do an honest work and be sure? And they'll love and be proud of it. Proud of it. Be proud of it. Sir, I will do that. All right. Can I just say to you that uh, the New Yorker is running three long, long sections about family assistance. I think you will be pleased because they, they are really astounded as they found out what you'd done. And yeah. They just didn't believe it. And they said, "Really? You know?" And yeah. it. it uh, yeah. uh, the other thing is that I will. Uh, this Pakistan thing. I'm thinking about it from the terms of the Pakistanis who I yeah. think may need your help and advice. Yeah. And if I could trouble you, yeah. after you come back from China and things like that, perhaps... Well, that may be too late. Why don't you come down in a month? All right. Sir. After the U.N. session. After the session. No, no, no. Uh, well, before... Yeah. As the session is ending, sort of? In December, maybe? December's a good time. All right. 
December or November even. If you've got thoughts, come down in November. That may be better. All right, I'll, I'll tell Bob Haldeman. But I'll tell Bob, and also we've got to get, get Henry in this, because he's very close to the Pakistan ambassador and the Indian ambassador, and we're working like hell on it. And with, You know, we put in $250 million more, dollars more, but that isn't going to do any do it. good. Well, it's, it'll feed him. as much. No one else has done anything. Yet. It'll feed him. Yeah. Mr. President, you're doing wonderfully. Are you feeling well, as good as you sound? I'm fine. I'm fine. And we're, we're working on a lot of things, and incidentally, uh, some developments next week may be of very great interest up in your shop. Well, I, I'll look yeah. forward to that. Yeah. Okay. How do you like what you're doing? Um, oh, well, I like the U.N., and I'm trying to keep out of George Bush's hair and do yeah. some things that he has sure. time for. Great. And I'm writing, a, uh, I'm about to make a very nasty speech to the Russians who gave us pissed all over us the other day, yeah. uh, pointing out there are trade union protests in this country against the Nixon administration. Now, isn't that a goddamn shame? I am going to say to them that I can see they would be surprised coming from a country where the last trade union protest was in 1917. <laughs> okay. Let them think about that. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right.